Demison, uh, hello, how are you? Hello, uh, recovering from a long trip. Yeah, no? <laughs> uh, well, uh, for us, it's a, it's a real pleasure to, that uh, you have accepted the invitation of the Las Voces de, de Satoshi. Uh, well, if you want, we can start with the, with the interview right, right now. Um, Sounds good. Yeah. But first of all, uh, how did you meet Bitcoin? It was our first scene in love. I'll never remember exactly um, because I heard about it several times. Uh, this was probably 11 years ago. Um, it was coming up on, on various technical news websites. And like most people, I dismissed it several times before I started looking into it. And it wasn't until the third or fourth time that I actually went, I read the white paper. And because I have a computer science background, uh, I thought this was a very interesting way of approaching a problem that I had never even thought about. And it, it was also interesting to me just from a philosophical, you know, freedom and, and liberty leaning individual, uh, you know, the idea that money is a concept that should not be controlled by a, a small number of people. You know, it money is something that we all are agreeing upon using. So it seems like anyone who cares should be able to input, you know, and contribute to what they think uh, money should be like. I think one of your first sites, Bitcoin, a fork or Bitcoin repository. How did this fork and Bitcoin change both uh, techni technically and Yes, this was my first step into just trying to understand Bitcoin and trying to understand, trying to help other people understand Bitcoin. Um, I had been sort of lurking on forums uh, and Bitcoin talk for a year or two at that point, and I still had a lot of questions. And specifically, I decided that there was a missing piece of transparency where the, the, the idea of Bitcoin is that it works because it is open and it is transparent. You know, anyone uh, who wants to can look into various aspects of it and understand how it's working. But when I was trying to do that with the Bitcoin nodes, uh, I did not really understand what was going on inside of the nodes. Uh, I'm also, I'm not a C++ developer by trade. So like reading the code, I could kind of get an idea of it, but I wanted this uh, operational understanding. You know, if I'm running the Bitcoin node, what are the actual operations? What are the resources that it's consuming? Um, how is it acting and reacting to other peers on the network? And so, Really what I did is I took a lot of the tools that I was using for my job at the time where I would create these dashboards for internal systems that I was uh, managing at a, a large marketing company. And um, you know, I, I, I put this uh, metrics reporting logic into the Bitcoin core so that it would just start spitting out statistics whenever an interesting event happened. And then I would use the other sort of traditional uh, operational dashboard software that was out there to collect them and to create these dashboards. And so I think that project was generally successful because it was over the years referenced by a number of Bitcoin developers when they were talking about different aspects of the network trying to make arguments uh, for like why we should make certain changes. So, you know, that was, like I said, that was the first real contribution that I made to the ecosystem. And within about one year after that, I decided to go full time. And of course, you know, just having that side project under my belt helped me, you know, have some credibility that 
I, I understood Bitcoin and I was you know interested in contributing. We are talking of of a early era of Bitcoin. It was mm -hmm. for you. It was like a leap of dedicate full time. It was it was very early. Um, it was not easy at the time because most of the developer jobs were in the Silicon Valley and I was in North Carolina, okay. the complete opposite side of the United States. So um, I felt like I had an opportunity because there was venture capital coming into the space. There was uh, you know, job openings available, though nothing in my local area. And so I, I basically, I pitched myself as, you know, I want to work with you and I think I can contribute, but I don't want to move 3000 miles away. So we, we actually entered into a, a short term contract where you know, I, I was not a full-time employee for about three months. And, you know, after I proved myself for several months, then they actually allowed me to become the first, uh, remote developer at BitGo. And, you know, that was an interesting experience too, because we, at, at the time we were playing around with various remote, uh, technology. Uh, like there was one thing that was basically an iPad on wheels, this little robot that I could, uh, wheel around the office and talk to people. Um, you know, there was not a lot of great teleconferencing options at the time, but, um, you know, that got my foot in the door and uh, the next three years were very interesting, especially with, uh, scaling debate stuff. And, and then it was a very small pivot for me to take a lot of what I learned there and basically apply best practices for self-custody and security uh, more to the individual level instead of enterprise level. And and today your your idea of Bitcoin is the, is the same than 13 years ago or has changed with the... It has definitely evolved uh, in, in many different ways. Um, you know, I think I'll, I'll probably be publishing some thoughts on the you know, historical evolution of prevailing narratives. You know, what is Bitcoin? This is something that I've been writing about almost since the beginning of my involvement. And I think that it's one of the, the fundamental underlying questions that a lot of us who you know, spend a lot of our time thinking about Bitcoin are, are still grappling with, um, because you know, this is a technology, you know, it is software. It's theoretically, it can change, uh, in any way, but there are many different aspects to the, the way that the, the system itself operates that make it very difficult to change. So, you know, there is this growing movement of, uh, ossification, uh, which is, you know, people who are saying, you know, we need to stop changing Bitcoin at all because there is risks to doing that. And meanwhile, um, technologists like myself see a, a wide variety of room for improvement, things that I believe we can and should change about Bitcoin that can be done to add functionality to improve the security and, and of course to make these changes within the constraints of, of the properties that we consider to be fundamental. You know, it's, 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 it's a difficult thing to talk about because if you, if you really propose changing anything about Bitcoin that could somehow cause harm or impose extra work or create problems for other people in the ecosystem, then you know, that is likely to cause pushback and contention and, and make it very difficult for that change to be accepted. Now that you are talking about ossification and changes Bitcoin, right now we have a real tough controversy about ordinals, that kind of okay. Bitcoin, NFT. What do you think about this? Yes, uh, I, I've 
tweeted about it a few times, including just a few minutes ago. Um, if there are a multitude of things that you can do with this technology and, you know, I am a computer scientist, so I, 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 my, my first perspective when I'm looking at any of these things is as a technologist, um, if, if I look at the protocol as just a sort of type of programming interface, you know, what can I code up that can use the rules of this protocol? You know, I look at the blockchain as a database. So yes, it can be used to quote unquote, move money around or to store money, but you can also put arbitrary data in it. Now there's a lot of constraints around what you can really do with that data, how much data, uh, you know, different formats. But at the end of the day, this is programmable money. And even though the programming language for Bitcoin is very, very restrictive, whenever you have any sort of programming language, uh, any sort of complexity to um, an, an architecture where you can build things with it, then you're going to find that somebody is, is going to be creative and they're going to find sort of uh, unanticipated use cases. And, and that's what we're seeing happen right now is that, you know, a new use case has been developed and I think from the social angle, this is more likely it's like a pushback. It's, it's people who are trolling other people. Um, they're, they're doing this to incite a reaction because they know that it will upset other people. I will be surprised if it really turns into a like robust, large market. Um, the way that the, the, these new types of Bitcoin NFTs are designed, it's not economically viable in the long term. And, and that's because the Bitcoin block space is very constrained. The only reason that it's economically possible right now is because we're in a bear market and very few people are actually using Bitcoin. So the demand for that block space is at all time lows. And you can get away with using the the minimum fee rate, you know, one Satoshi per virtual byte fee rate. So I think that you can basically create these new Bitcoin NFTs for something like twenty to fifty dollars. And it's not at hard hard at all to imagine you know, when fees go back to you know normal activity that that could easily become 500, 5,000, if not more dollars to create one of these things. So then you have to ask yourself, you know, will, will this NFT market become so big that people will be willing to pay many thousands of dollars to create these things? And, you know, maybe it will, uh, you know, there are of course examples, I think on Ethereum of, of people paying hundreds or thousands of dollars to mint NFTs, but yeah, this is more of a like trading hype cycle question, I think, uh, around the economics. Talking about uh, trading with Bitcoin, uh, one of your side projects is when do I sell my Bitcoin? No? <laughs> um, and how do you explain uh, volatility to a person who doesn't have uh, much idea about the, the crypto world because it's uh, very related? Yeah, I mean, from a investment perspective, and I, I very rarely think of Bitcoin uh, from the investment side because, like I said, I'm a technology guy um, and I'm a very bad trader. Uh, I'm pretty sure most of the trades I've ever done, I would have been better off if I had not. The only trade that I don't regret was like originally buying Bitcoin many, many years ago. Um, I think that you find that most people who sell Bitcoin end up regretting it. And that's because we're still so early in the adoption of it, uh, even though it's, you know, uh, 14 years so far, the, the actual adoption level still probably only around what, maybe 10% globally. But, um, for, because of that, if you believe that the Bitcoin 
will continue to exist, then it's it's not going to go to zero. Uh, then you know this is a common um, belief. It's, either it fails and it goes to zero, or it ends up somewhere a lot higher than where it is right now, um, because it's it's pretty rare for revolutionary technologies to only gain like 10% adoption and just stop there and remain a niche thing. It's, um, you know, it's, it's either going to go full mainstream or it's not going to be interesting enough for many people to adopt it. And most likely something else will come along that will be better and we'll, we'll finally get that mainstream adoption. So yeah, the main thing with that calculator is that the idea is, you know, if you if you need to quote unquote take profit, you know, if if you need to trade your Bitcoin for something else, maybe you want to upgrade to a better house or something, um, that you know you should limit how much of it you are getting rid of because you know if you're trading your Bitcoin for something else, I think the safest assumption to make is that over the long term. Um, You'll, you'll never be able to, to earn that much Bitcoin again. Uh, you know, unless you're lucky and you, you know, you manage to time the, the tops and the bottoms of the cycle, but I think very few people are able to do that. Um, that's why you should really limit how much you're selling so that, you know, you can continue to enjoy, you know, a better lifestyle and, you know, sort of reap the rewards of holding Bitcoin for a long time, but still have enough that you. You won't stay awake at night regretting selling all of your Bitcoin several years ago. Right now, uh, we are we are seeing some mainstream adoption, and certain bonds, we've seen a problem with the security, private key. How important is Bitcoin security for you? You know, this is a fundamental problem that I have spent the past eight years working on. And it's interesting to see the sort of explosion of different projects in this space and people working on very cutting edge uh, scaling or privacy or, or, or other functionality. Whereas I, I, th I still think we have not yet fully solved this very low level problem like all of the other stuff is reliant upon people being able to secure their private keys and be able to do self custody you know, the the entire point of this space is to eliminate trusted third parties and yet the the depressing aspect of watching bitcoin go more mainstream is that it appears that you know the vast majority of this mainstream adoption is happening through custodians, you know, trusted third parties. So, you know, inevitably trusted third parties fail for one reason or another, and that becomes a major setback for the entire space because a lot of the, you know, the latest generation of adopters, you know, they may have thought that, you know, FTX is Bitcoin or Binance is Bitcoin. I've certainly heard that uh, from a number of people where like they just, you know, open up the Binance app and like, this is my Bitcoin wallet. And uh, it, it's it's an educational issue. It's it's somewhat an incentives and sort of a social pressure problem. Um, I'm also planning on publishing something soon about sort of self-regulation in the space and like, why do we continue to fail to uh, put pressure on custodians to be better actors and to have better practices. Um, you know, it's, um, for me, what I'm really doing is I'm, I'm kind of fighting against the tide. Uh, I am trying to make self custody more user friendly and more convenient because it's, it's very clear to me that if we don't continue to improve the uh, the experience around self-custody then unfortunately people will choose the easiest option you know people almost always choose the path of least resistance whatever is more convenient is going to win and in this you know this incentives problem has caused issues 
in a number of, of different spaces and, and aspects of humanity. Now it's, it's understandable and, you know, you can even step back and you can look at sort of society at large and see how humans over the past few thousand years have architected some very efficient uh, structures of like capitalism at least um, and and these these companies and, and structures are able to be very uh, productive and and this is because we're, we're leveraging uh, specialization so you know as a human these days very few people worry about you know like the, the the base layers of the maslow hierarchy of needs you know very few people are having to farm their own food and spend a large amount of their time just worrying about surviving they're they're sort of ratcheting up higher and higher to doing more specialized things which they're getting you know paid better for because of the special nature of whatever their skill set is uh and the the result of this is that we're farming out so to speak many critical aspects of our lives so it's creating fragility uh you know we're we're getting more um and that more productivity at the expense of like fragility in society so if you think about it like if there was some sort of major infrastructure supply chain collapse or whatever this is problematic now because very few people have the ability to sustain themselves they don't have their own food supply rather we've created a very efficient but not very robust you know, set of supply chains that are, are doing this uh, just-in-time delivery of, of goods and services to us. So uh, to kind of get back to the, the whole point about Bitcoin and self-custody, it's the same thing with financial services, is that we've farmed out uh, most of the aspects of our financial lives to trusted third parties. So like, this is the status quo and as a result you know with bitcoin going more mainstream people come into bitcoin and they are expecting the status quo of having a trusted third party who is you know managing their private keys and who has like a support uh system that you know they can ask questions to and they they in many cases they don't want the responsibility or to have to put in a lot of effort to do it themselves uh, because so that same mindset applies to many other aspects of your life. So, you know, there is the question of the value proposition and, and getting people to understand, you know, you don't have to trust a third party anymore. And perhaps it is worth you uh, putting in a little bit of effort because you can protect yourself uh, from various calamities. But yeah, uh, if we don't do that, then ultimately, the vast majority of Bitcoin or at least of Bitcoin users once again ends up in the hands of a small number of trusted third parties. We're essentially recreating the traditional banking system and those choke points will get squished by regulators and, uh, and the usability and the sort of properties of Bitcoin as people understand it because they're using it through these choke points will be greatly diminished you know at least in the united states we seem to be seeing more uh regulatory action or you know, rumors of that happening i know in a few european countries uh, they have clamped down a bit and are you know kind of forcing more aml kyc and, and other restrictions around how people can interact with these custodians so it's, it's a systemic risk to the, the health of the entire ecosystem is, you know, having too much centralization and a few parties. Uh, let me say, well, uh, we are coming to the, to the end and I have uh, the, the last question, um, but you, you dedicate a lot of time, uh, to training on your website and your Twitter account. And so do you think we can bring a uh, Bitcoin closer to the, to the world? Well, you know, even though I, I spend so much time 
uh, curating the educational content and stuff. Um, like I said, a lot of people, they're, they're not going to be willing to invest a lot of their time into understanding systems. So while it certainly helps to have content out there that's available for people who are curious enough to do the research, uh, at the end of the day, I think the, the most effective thing is going to be, you know, creating the incentives to get people to use it in the first place. So, you know, you, you, you have to provide the value. Uh, I think, you know, for, at least for a lot of people in first world countries, unfortunately, the only value they see in Bitcoin is the, the trading of the, the volatility, right? Is that, oh, I'm going to get rich as a result of this. And, you know, there is, you know, that's, I guess it's good that that exists, but, but that also results in many of those people missing a lot of the underlying value of why these systems are important. And so, you know, seeing other use cases, like even these Bitcoin NFTs, uh, for example, while I don't find a value in it, I can see that the, this has the ability to potentially attract people who otherwise would have not even looked at Bitcoin. So um, yeah. I'm a technologist, you know, continue to build, uh, continue to experiment. Many of these experiments will fail, but uh, you know, this is why I do want to see you know, more activity happening around Bitcoin and also kind of going back to some of the, the ossification and development stuff is that you know, I would like to see, uh, you know, more development on the side of uh, you know, side chains, drive chains, other sort of Bitcoin pegged systems, because I believe that that will help for more value to flow into the, the greater Bitcoin ecosystem. But, you know, you could have a, a whole uh, debate around some of the complexities that arise with that, uh, as uh, I have had uh, just over the past week. And I'll, I'll, I'll be delving more into that on my blog as well. Well, uh, Jamison, it has been a, a real pleasure to, to have you here. <laughs>